everyone. Um, we're going to get started real quick. We're uh, navigating a, a quick technical thing to get um, all the participants in the conference here. So just a sec. Okay, well, in the interest of time, I, I know we're uh, seven minutes past here, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, first, um, just wanted to welcome you all to this uh, three-day virtual conference entitled Parts of the Whole, Critical Aspects to Support Pre-K to Grade 3. Uh, we greatly appreciate the time you're devoting to participate in this conference and hope it provides some valuable takeaways uh, for the incredibly important work you're doing in the States. My name is Matt Weyer. I'm a senior policy analyst with Education Commission of the States, and I'll be the host for this three-day event. I'd like to quickly acknowledge the hard work of my colleagues at CSS, CCSSO, NGA, and the National P3 Centers, specifically um, Beth Karen, Mandy Sorge, Tiffany Perrette, Ralph Graf Walner, Erica King, Christy Carrots, and Jim Lesko in preparing this, and to all of our uh, featured speakers, moderators, and uh, all the attendees as well. Uh, next slide, please. Tiffany, next slide. Thank you. Uh, so just a quick few housekeeping items. Um, we will ask that everyone will remain on mute when not speaking and that we're gonna ask um, uh, attendees not to show their video, just to lower, um, to keep the bandwidth high in the resolution for all those presenters that will be speaking. You'll receive a recording of the webinar um, afterwards. And we do have uh, a chat box feature. So if you have any questions, please enter them there. And we also have two support staff here to help with any uh, logistic issues that may arise as well. And uh, so the next slide. So the goal for the, the overarching conference is to really um, focus on whole child strategies to support kids. Uh, these include strategies such as focusing on social emotional learning, mental health consultation, and uh, meaningful family engagement. Uh, and we're really centering this work, uh, you know, during the, the current pandemic context as schools really approach reopening in earnest here over the next few weeks. Uh, next slide. One more. So for our first session, uh, we've got an excellent kickoff here. It's a keynote and panel discussion on aligning policy and practice to improve third grade outcomes in the area of COVID-19. And we have a uh, great panel of uh, chief uh, state superintendents from across the country. And now I'm going to pass it over to uh, Steve Bowen. Uh, he is the Deputy Executive Director for State Leadership at the Council of Chief State School Officers, who's going to moderate this session. Steve? Yeah, unmute. Great. Thank you, Matt. And uh, sorry, everybody, for a few technical glitches. Uh, we're still not, we're still wrestling with these technologies even uh, months into into COVID. So I hope you all uh, are doing well. I'm really glad you could be with us and especially uh, glad and very thankful to our state chiefs uh, for joining us today. We know, don't even want to comprehend the number of things on your plates uh, that you're dealing with right now, especially with uh, the approach of back to school um, any day now. You've probably got schools back already in some of your districts. So uh, we'll dive right in here because we're running a little behind. Uh, this is really an exciting session because we've got kind of a twofer here. Uh, we're going to start off with a uh, background and sort of presentation uh, by Ohio Superintendent of Public Instruction, uh, Paolo Dumaria, uh, to give us a little sense of kind of what Ohio's been doing and set the ground for kind of approaches that states can take in this area. And then um, once we get uh, through Paolo's presentation, we'll open it up if there's any questions and answers, and then we'll move to our chief panel um, with our uh, chiefs who will also share what they're doing, respond to Paolo and, and share what they're doing in their states as well. So really excited about this. Again, thanks to everybody for joining. We know you've got a lot going on and, and really appreciate you being with us today to dig in on this this critical, critical topic. And I say that not only as some of our CCS and so, but as the husband of a pre-K uh, and early childhood teacher. So uh, I know how critical this is. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Paolo and we'll get underway. 
Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you today, highlighting some of the things that are happening in Ohio. I think we, we're doing a lot in the state. We have a long way to go, and that's why I always enjoy these kinds of experiences to talk and share and learn. Um, I'm really going to spend some time talking about two things. One is Each Child Our Future, which is our state strategic plan for the education system of the state, and then our whole child framework, which is a more recently produced document that I think has a lot more relevancy to this particular session, but you can't really understand the second without understanding the first. I'll try to move through this quickly because I really want to get to the panel discussion and the Q&A. So let's go to the next slide. So as I said, um, Each Child Our Future is uh, the state strategic plan for education. This was completed in August 2018 and the result of a number of uh, community meetings, uh, regional town halls. Uh, you can find the entire document at education.ohio.gov slash strategic plan. It was our intention to try to use this as an opportunity to shift from being, uh, you know, both our organization and the education community from being reactive mode into proactive mode. If you go to the next slide. This slide really shows um, the, uh, you know, it's sort of an infographic that we put together. It's got a vision, it's got our, our main goal, it's got the four learning domains, which is a key element of this because it, for the first time for Ohio, pulls out social emotional learning as one of the key learning domains for students. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail of all the components, but suffice it to say then at the bottom, it's got 10 priority strategies. And right there, square in the middle in the bullseye is the whole child. Let's go to the next slide. One of the strategies was strategy eight, which focused on early learning and promoting the importance of early learning, expanding access to quality early learning experiences. And so through, through Ohio, and much of this predates the strategic plan, but it continues to this day. Let's go to the next slide. We have a really highly integrated and aligned pre-K three strategy. It has, it starts with a set of standards. We have an early childhood advisory committee that's made up of multiple agencies as well as stakeholder groups, uh, including Head Start community, including the philanthropic community. We have a quality program called Step Up to Quality that, in, that includes a five-star rating system as well as some incentives. We are uh, maintain close alignment with our Department of Job and Family Services, which also supports many uh, childcare settings across the state. We have a close connection to our Head Start community. We also have a kindergarten readiness assessment that we use uh, and that also supports a number of localized initiatives around uh, uh, early childhood access uh, and success. Uh, we also have a significant literacy emphasis, uh, including diagnostic uh, assessments, uh, a third grade reading guarantee and so forth. And then we have a set of SEL standards. Go, let's go to the next slide. The other uh, strategy that I wanna highlight is actually strategy seven, which says working together with parents, caregivers and community partners to help schools meet the needs of the whole child. Strategy seven is really the focal point of Ohio's whole child strategy. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, and so what I want to do is transition into talking about why we have an Ohio's whole child framework. It started out coming off the strategic plan and strategy seven. We felt like we needed to take the opportunity to amplify the words of the strategic plan and take them a step further. So uh, the next slide, uh, we convened a behavioral health and wellness education advisory committee. This started in April of 2018. Uh, it was called together by the State Board of Education and given a fairly broad charge of focusing on a variety of issues. We were dealing with uh, prevention issues, bullying issues, uh, depression, anxiety, mental health, um, and social emotional learning. And, and we felt like we wanted to pull all those sort of things that had kind of been dealt with separately into a single um, arena and try to weave them together into a more comprehensive approach. Next slide, please. So the work of the Behavioral Health and Wellness Advisory Committee started by focusing on what the needs of schools and students were, did a broad uh, review of both existing resources in Ohio and other parts of the country, uh, took the opportunity to identify gaps, created a behavioral health and wellness toolkit um, and went on to make some additional recommendations, all of which can be available, uh, th again, through our education.ohio.gov uh, website. Next slide, please. And then among their recommendations was really to um, establish the committee as an ongoing committee to advise and counsel both me as the superintendent and the state board, as well as um, other stakeholders and policymakers around this notion of meeting the needs of the whole child, and then develop a coherent framework for whole school, whole community, and whole child activities, uh, as well as making sure that we then integrate all these things. Next slide, please. 
And so the whole child advisory group, it had, it was a fairly large group, 47 external stakeholders, but also then supported by an internal team, cross office team at the Department of Education. Um, and then just recently completed the development of the whole child framework. So let's uh, go to the next slide and review one more time uh, the charge. Uh, and again, developing the framework was key and uh, central to the work of the advisory group, as well as then tackling issues of promoting the value of the of whole school, whole community, whole child approach, and then reacting to and informing different guidance models, examples. One of the things we want to do is do a better job of, of sharing among and between uh, districts and schools in terms of the kinds of work that they're doing. Next slide. The work of the advisory group uh, uh, went across 11 months and we organized it into these different components. We had an internal team, which was really, you know, sort of the, the, um, the, the people who were working continually supporting the meetings, uh, supporting the work uh, day to day uh, that did planning, um, setting out, staying on plan. Uh, collecting feedback, reviewing feedback, synthesizing all the work that everybody else was doing. We had a series of work groups that were identifying and supporting many of the different components that ultimately emerged to be the framework, and then the whole child advisory committee itself. So let's go to the next slide. So this is an infographic, and we're gonna go through each of the parts of the infographic very quickly here, um, that reflects the work and, and the whole child framework for Ohio. There's the star at the center, there's that green ring, and I'll talk about those components in a minute. Then there's the, the white band around the green ring, uh, and then there's this set of 12 uh, co um, concept areas in the, in the middle there, that's the bulk of it. Then you have this maroon circle, which represents the family and these, these uh, gold sort of um, fins that represent community partnerships. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And you'll have a chance to see this graphic again after I explain all the different parts. The other thing I wanna explain, of course you can't read this, is that this is all accompanied by a document, a master document that lays out all the different pieces and parts and goes into greater detail about all the components. And it, it will serve as sort of a, a, a guide uh, and, and, and in some ways a strategic plan for the work of implementation going forward. Next slide, please. Obviously at the center of the whole thing is the whole child and that's represented by this gray star right in the very middle. Next slide. And that gray star is surrounded by what we call the five tenets, the five tenets of the framework. And these were really in some ways um, borrowed from the ASCD whole child uh, framework uh, that we, that informed our strategic plan work. And we really liked, you know, these, these fundamental ideas, H health, safety, uh, being challenged, being supported, and being engaged. And some of those words echo the vision in our strategic plan, the notion that we want students to be challenged, engaged, and prepared, uh, and, and that dovetailed nicely. So all the, all the different things that we do mesh with these kind of five fundamental tenets uh, for what we feel are the important aspects for meeting the needs of the whole child. Let's go to the next slide. So the ring that surrounds the, the green circle are really what we call the systemic practices. Um, and these are four key concepts that um, we want to infuse all the work that we do. First and foremost is equity. Second is cultural responsiveness. Uh, that was a theme that really came out in the work, how important it is to make sure we are paying due attention to the cultural considerations and, and the work of meeting the needs of the whole child. Continuous improvement, which is something that, that really infuses the way we at the department do our work as well as what we promote among schools and districts in the state for how we want them to do their work. And then coordination and coherence among policy, among processes, and among practices. Next slide. Then um, surrounding that white circle are these 12 sort of segments um, that represent uh, all the components of school and health support systems. And you know, this you know, really speaks to this whole notion of, okay, well, what are those elements that we must all pay attention to in terms of meeting the needs of the whole child? And you'll see that there's a slight you know, shading difference of these diff of segments. And those are characterized by these four main categories. The first one being supporting students in developing healthy behaviors. The second one, services to students and families. The third one, engaging others 
to support student wellness and success. And finally, the components of a safe and supportive school environment. So I'm gonna go through each of these uh, very briefly over the next uh, four slides and then uh, cover the other uh, two and then I'll, then I'll be done and we can transition into the to panel discussion and question and answer. So next slide, please. Supporting students in developing healthy behaviors has these three segments. The first one is really just fundamental health education and making sure that that's part of each student's um, you know, uh, educational experience and understanding you know, what, what being healthy means, what are healthy practices, and what is one's own cognition about one's own health uh, involved. It also has uh, the second wedge is physical education and physical activity, making sure that we take opportunities during the academic day and year uh, to infuse in students the importance of physical education and physical activity. And then finally, something that we're, we're doing a lot of in Ohio lately is, is this element of social emotional learning, both in terms of awareness, behavioral health, mental health, uh, and those kinds of aspects of understanding uh, for students as part of their uh, growth and development. Next slide, please. The next three uh, wedges speak to services to students and families. Um, and again, this you know, actually um, is more about uh, how we, uh, as the education community, deliver these things. First and foremost, and we all have a longstanding history and tradition with school and child nutrition, so that's at the top. And then increasingly in Ohio, we're seeing a lot of delivery of health services happening in our schools as we increase partnerships with health providers, with our children's hospitals, uh, and with others uh, in terms of making sure that students who might other, not otherwise have access to the healthcare system can in some way, shape, or form access that through their school community. And that's done with lots of great partnerships. And then finally, behavioral health services. We're seeing an increasing uh, need and understanding of the importance of behavioral health, partnering with our county mental health boards, as well as a whole series of mental health providers through support through Medicaid uh, and other uh, kind of financing structures in terms of helping students meet those needs as well. I don't, I don't wanna mislead you to believe that all three of these, obviously the child nutrition is probably the most well-developed. Health services and behavioral health services are continuing to grow and expand in the work we're doing in Ohio. Next slide, please. We know, and one of the key, you know, sort of principles in our in our strategic plan, in that blue box, it talks about partnerships, and we're so hugely focused on, um, you know, making it clear that helping support and develop our students is everybody's business. So these two segments are in the engaging others to support student wellness, and that's family engagement, really creating uh, strong connections to family, uh, engaging them, helping them understand what the school uh, is doing and how we can work in partnership with families to support students, and then. And community involvement. Who are the other organizations? Are they governmental? Are they philanthropic? Are they faith-based? Are they uh, social service? Are they community service organizations? Uh, and how do we integrate them into the ultimate goal of supporting and meeting the needs of the whole child? Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, these four sec segments, uh, which really speak to a safe and supportive school environment. Clearly, school climate and culture, we're seeing a lot of attention being paid to that. Uh, we're doing a lot of work in Ohio uh, through a recently awarded uh, school climate uh, transformation grant from the federal government around um, you know, climate and culture and creating, uh, 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 deploying PBIS activity and supporting that in our schools uh, and districts. School safety clearly is an important part of the overall uh, school environment strategy. Uh, making sure the physical environment is one that's conducive uh, to learning and other activities. And ultimately staff wellness and self-care is a part of that school environment um, um, uh, component. So that brings us now to the um, to the uh, last um, two pieces, and that's really this. You know, we we really wanted to, in addition to the to the one segment about family engagement, we really wanted to emphasize the importance of family support as uh, an element of um, of this of this framework. And so there's that maroon band that goes around the whole thing. That's really our way of saying. Family, 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 it's so very important. Um, and, and, it, and it transcends all the different aspects of, um, of the framework. And then uh, beyond that sort of amplifying as well, that notion of community partnerships and the importance of uh, deliberately engaging and aligning all the various community structures that may exist uh, in terms, again, of delivering against 
the 12 segments in the, in the inner ring uh, in the interest of meeting the needs of the whole child. So again, it's a very sort of quick review and overview of our whole child framework. And the next slide, you'll see it once again, all, all put together and we can, um, um, uh, and you can find that again, if you uh, look on our, on our, uh, our website, we have additional information, although it's going through its sort of final approval stages. So you may not see uh, quite as much as I've actually shown you here. We'll make sure people have access to the PowerPoint deck uh, going forward. Uh, you know, right now we're also, in the next slide, uh, you know, fundamentally thinking about implementation and next steps mm -hmm. and what comes next. And that's gonna require lots of uh, professional development, lots of engagement with our education community and our partners. Um, but, but what I always tell people is the work the state does is always a little bit lagged. We're already seeing many schools and districts doing this work, doing it deliberately, doing it diligently, doing it aggressively. Uh, and we're excited to amplify that work and then continue to uh, bring it to, to scale, replicate it in places and, and, and at the same time also leave enough flexibility for every school and district to make this approach his or her own. Um, and that uh, concludes uh, my presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Paolo. That was, uh, that was terrific. Let me, um, well, I want to move along to the panel here in a minute, but just a couple of quick questions for you uh, on that whole trial framework. One is, uh, obviously, this is in development. We're working on it. COVID came along kind of in the middle of this. Did that did that require any um, looking again? Did we miss something? Did you go back to it? Did you take it apart and reassemble it? Did it did the, the arrival of COVID on the scene, uh, you know, necessitate any review of where you how far you had gone with this with this model and whether it was going to be able to respond to the COVID challenge? Yeah, that's a great question, Steve. I think it did a little bit, right? It, it pushed us to go back and look at the different components. I think it actually affirmed that what we had and where we were going uh, were moving in the right direction. If anything, it called us in to say, um, are we looking at things from a remote delivery perspective specifically enough and, and, and emphatically okay. enough, knowing that that was gonna be a main um, a thrust of some of the reopening activity. And to be honest with you, uh, also uh, reflecting some of the developments in the last several months, it, it, we took a step back on our equity language right. and our right. equity issues and attempted to strengthen that throughout the document as well. Okay, and just one other quick question, and this is a, a little bit of a preview for the other chiefs. Um, you had you started off by showing us the PK3 piece that you've done. You had eight bullets and strategies around that. Feels like I know from being in state government, lots of different roles, trying to link pieces together and connect various initiatives, various initiatives. We have a strategy over here that's particular to PK3. Now you've got this overarching, like the bolting of those together. How are you, and you, you'd said implementation's underway, you're working on it. How are you thinking about making sure that the, these two initiatives don't just live in isolation from each other, but there's there actually one is informing the other and, and that you uh, that these these two different initiatives really end up being one initiative in terms of uh, service to the folks you're there to support. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we actually did some work and finding the points of intersection between, you know, what I would characterize mm -hmm. as the main components of our PK3 um, strategy uh, and how those interfaced. And, and I think we found like there was there was really solid intersection. And so, um, you know, s some of it really comes down to uh, sort of the academic side of things. I mean, a lot of a lot of the thrust of our strategy tends to speak to the academic side. And then and then the whole child framework t goes extends beyond that into, you know, uh, again, those multiple aspects of the whole child. Uh, you know, some of our SEL standards kind of have some some decent overlap and crossover. Um, but but we mm -hmm. feel like there was really good integration and that we're not going to have much of a challenge in as we talk to people for them sort of getting confused and saying, well, I'm doing this over here. How does this fit in? I think we'll find that, yeah. uh, that crossover. So by design, there's a little bit of that. You already had built yeah. in some of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of the I people that. that did this work are key people in our, right. our K3 uh, and work as well. Got it, got it. I appreciate it. Thanks, Paolo. All right, so let's transition over to our panel. Again, very thankful that we've got uh, three state chiefs here who've taken time out of their extraordinarily uh, busy days uh, to be with us to dig in on this issue, particularly about how do we move uh, this work forward in the context of these other challenges um, uh, that we're facing and do it in a coherent way, in a thoughtful way, in the kind of way that, that Paolo just laid out for us where we're, we're really working off concrete plans with concrete deliverables. So uh, we've got Terry Wright with us from Mississippi, State Superintendent of Schools in Mississippi, 
Uh, we've got Jillian Bala with us, the State Superintendent of Public Instruction in the great state of Wyoming, which is where we were going to have our member meeting last week, but we'll be there next year out in Wyoming to see Jillian and her team. And then Clayton Burt's the Superintendent of Schools in West Virginia. So we really appreciate all three of you being here. I thought what I'd do is sort of go in turn to uh, give each of you the floor for a little bit to share what you've been working on in your state, what are kind of the key priorities, if you have a, you know, a response to, to Paolo's piece, or does, does that provoke any thoughts for you about where you might want to go? Uh, and then we'll just kind of open it up and, and have a discussion here uh, about how we move this work uh, forward again, given all of the, uh, the, the crises that were the mounting and stacking crises that we're all dealing with. So, Carrie, why don't we start with you? Uh, I, I don't know if it was a year, probably two years ago now, I got a chance, uh, Chris and I, to come down to Mississippi and, and visit with you and go out and visit a site and got to see some of the work that you've been doing in early ch childhood in, in, uh, in Mississippi. We know this is a big priority for you. I uh, would love to hear what you're working on, where you are in this, what kind of next steps uh, and advice you have for our other folks um, on the call here. And, and then we'll, we'll keep going from there. Sure, thank you and thanks for having me. Um, so I wanted just to kind of paint the picture a little bit about some of the policies and practices and resources that we put into our pre-K through grade three uh, initiative because um, I do think it, it forms a, a good picture of, of what's been happening. You know, when I arrived in 2013, um, our, our fourth graders were more than one grade level below grade level in uh, according to Nate. Um, the, just the state was rated last in the nation. I mean, we really had a lot, a lot of work to do. And the legislature and the State Board of Ed decided to really make um, literacy a focus. And so this coincided at the same time that we had introduced uh, much higher um, standards uh, across the board in K-12. But they passed two pieces of legislation, which I think are really critical. One was the Early Learning Collaborative Act, and that was the first time that Mississippi had ever given any money to public pre-K. And, and the other one was the Learning, excuse me, the Literacy-Based Promotion Act. It was both done the same year, and that really put a focus uh, on reading and also on uh, children being required to, to pass the test before they moved on. It also opened up our eyes because when I got to Mississippi, we didn't have a department for early childhood, and we didn't have a department for literacy. So you had these two laws that were being passed. We knew we needed to do something, so we had to move pretty quick. The Early Learning Collaborative Act is a really nice partnership between school districts, head starts, nonprofits, um, daycare, et cetera, uh, to deliver on high quality early childhood education. We, was, we started with a, a small amount of money. We started as a pilot um, with about 1,500 kids and, uh, and then watched how that um, has transpired. And over the years, funding and enrollment have more than doubled. Um, and the reason is because our children that are coming out of our collaboratives are already more than prepared for kindergarten and they're outperforming all of their peers, whether their peers are coming from private pre-K, Head Start, or family care. And also the National Institute of Early Education Research has recognized Mississippi as being one of the very few states in the nation uh, that meet all of their 10 quality indicators. In fact, this past year, we were only one of four that met all of their 10 quality indicators. So that we developed standards um, in, for three-year-olds and four-year-olds, and then we went back with a group of practitioners and developed birth through three standards, and now we've got a seamless set of standards that are aligned uh, pre-K through grade 12. The Literacy-Based Promotion Act gave us funds to uh, hire literacy coaches, and we were the ones that hired those coaches because we knew how important their job was. And we put them based on our data in our lowest performing schools. And so we've got literacy coaches now all over the state. We also had another bucket of money inside that that we were funded to provide professional development. We knew that we were not seeing our teachers ready to teach reading on, on day one. So our whole professional development took on a stance of making sure that all of our teachers and special ed and our administrators knew the science of reading and were focusing on the foundational skills of reading. That has been uh, ongoing. Uh, we've also been in making sure that the science of reading was first and foremost. We led that work because we felt it was important that the language be consistent and that the messaging around the power of the science of reading uh, be consistent. We also started requiring all early elementary teachers to take a test in the foundational skills of reading in order to know whether or not they were able to do that. Um, and you know, a lot of people with those of us that have these third grade, here it's called the third grade gate, and I hate that term, but it, that is what it is. Um, 
focused on the retention part of it. And we did not. We focused on the prevention part of it. And so mm -hmm. that was, we didn't even talk about retention. We talked about meeting students' needs, meeting them where they were, and giving our teachers the resources that they need. And it paid off. Um, the first year we had to take this assessment, um, we had 85% um, passing. But three years later, it grew to 93%. So I went back to the legislature and asked them to raise the bar because the bar I felt was too low and it wasn't close to proficiency. And so they did, gave districts three years of a lead time. And then this past year, even with a higher bar and a more, um, more um, powerful test, uh, the pass rate was at 86%. So we've seen this whole focus uh, pay off for us. And Rolf is gonna put a um, document in the chat box that has links to all of the resources that we developed. We developed a parent read at home plan. We developed a strong readers website. I would love for you to visit that. That's on the landing page of our website. And it's strictly for parents and they can click on a grade, they can click on a subject and move right through about what they can do at home. Family success guides in English and in Spanish. Family engagement toolkit. That was part of our work with CCSSO that that came out of that. Uh, an English learner guide, um, et cetera. So we've really tried to push the envelope and COVID has, made us very aware of a lot of the inequities now that exist between children that are connected and children that are not. And I think the one thing that we decided to do, we decided to take us on as a statewide plan. We were working with our legislature. We got them to fund $200 million for us to do a statewide initiative that will, in essence, put a device in everybody's hand. It will expand connectivity. It will give every district a learning management system on which to load, uh, load high quality instructional materials. All of our devices mm -hmm. are gonna be cellular enabled so that even if you're not near the Wi-Fi, if you're near a cell tower, you can still do your work, but have the ability for teachers to load their work onto those learning management systems. And then whether they're connected or not, the kids will still be at home and be able to accomplish that. So we are, um, we're real excited about that. It includes a whole section on professional development, as you can imagine. But we also added, and Paula, this made me think about what you were talking about, the whole child. We also added a whole component around telehealth and teletherapy, because we knew a lot of families and a lot of teachers and a lot of children were struggling. And we wanted them to connect to professionals that could help them across the state. Mississippi is a very rural state. And I can tell you the moment that I announced that, the Mississippi Medical Association and the Mississippi Academy of Pediatrics, they were so excited to be partners with us in expanding telehealth and teletherapy. So, uh, that, and we're working with them as we speak in order um, to get that done. I think as state chiefs, I feel it's a moral imperative that we mm -hmm. do everything we can to make sure that children are learning, whether they're at home or whether they're at school. And all of our districts were allowed to choose the model that they wanted. Um, and so our governor actually, I think, is getting ready to come out with some new news today uh, and about what we're going to be doing. Um, but I think you could either go virtually, you could have a hybrid, or you could go in person. But those of you that mm -hmm. are keeping an eye on the COVID virus, Mississippi has now become the poster child for the nation for the uptick with the highest positive rate in the nation. So uh, that puts us at number one, right? Um, no, just kidding. And I just think that uh, we've, we've got to realize that kids can learn at home and kids can learn at school, but we've got to be nimble enough to pivot either way. And I'll stop there. Great, great. Thanks, Kerry. So uh, I've got a host of questions, but I will, uh, I will hold. Um, and let's uh, hear from our other chiefs, and we'll come back and we'll get a discussion going here. So. Uh, why don't we uh, move ahead to you, Clayton, uh, in West Virginia. would love to hear a little more about what you guys are working on. We know um, specifically the sort of transition into kindergarten, into public schools, making that transition for kids has been a focus area. But love to get your sense of how things are going, what you're working on, any responses to, to Carrie or Paolo and the things they presented. And then we'll, we'll, get, we'll go on to Jillian and we'll get a discussion going. So thanks, Clayton. Thank you, Stephen. Um, you know, Carrie, I can't thank you enough. Listening to your story reminds me of what we're dealing with in West Virginia. And Paolo, uh, that work around the whole child uh, reminded me, I've actually got my, my right hand to, uh, for our early childhood. She's been with me since, uh, um, oh my goodness, 1996. Uh, Monica Delame, who leads our early childhood efforts. We've worked in a lot of different fields together. And listening to Paolo talk about that framework in Ohio reminds me um, in February, West Virginia will celebrate uh, 19 years uh, since our universal pre-K bill passed. 
And it, wow. it's interesting to listen um, to both Carrie and, and Paolo talk about where they're at because in West Virginia, 19 years, um, it passed in 2002. And so thinking about where we came, I was in the right. same boat. We didn't have an office of early learning when I first got here. I came in and was asked to do specifically universal pre-K. And I really believed in that work. The universal pre-K work was going to be about the whole child. It was going to be about communities and families being really the cornerstone of how we pull this together. Um, I'm so proud of our collaboratives with the uh, child care and Head Start. It's a universal Every four-year-old we're pushing down into three-year-olds has access. And in 2013, it would be eight years ago in the spring, um, we hit universal access. So every family, every child. However, you know, with that being said, it kind of leads me to this idea of what happened during that time in a state education agency in a state such as West Virginia um, that really led to this pre-K three or beyond initiative. So I was so glad to watch Paolo talk about the whole child and the impact it's having in all areas. And mm -hmm. I think that's something West Virginia wants to really focus in on. It's um, uh, the joke here is I'm the first state superintendent to come from strictly an early childhood background. Um, I draw more pictures of state board meetings and legislative meetings than anybody ever. But, you know, Stephen, I know you're laughing, but yeah. That's really not a joke. The joke is I truly have always believed that if we want to push this idea of really tackling the issues we're going to tackle beyond the pre-K to third grade, we're going to have to pay attention to what happened. And I really like that Carrie used the word preventative versus uh, retention. And focusing on prevention is the key. I truly believe that, Carrie. I think you're spot on in Wyoming County. I'm so fortunate. I'm on my fourth governor I I've worked for. Uh, to have governors that recognize the root issues and root problems. Um, and it should not be the burden of our teachers to tackle these problems on their own. Um, the state of West Virginia, just like Carrie mentioned, as we're looking at this pre-K third grade approach, um, one year ago, uh, this month, one year ago, as we were getting ready to enter the 1920 school year, I was actually given a keynote to our, our 55 superintendents, our district superintendents. And I was reminding them, uh, Stephen, that in the state of West Virginia, I was reminding them of our efforts around pre-K three. I was reminding them that we do have a third grade reading initiative. And I also agree, I hate having that timeline and specific, like there's something magic about third grade. But the beauty is we do have a state that, that focuses on birth through third grade. So there has to be a strong whole child family community approach that really looks at what happened in this child's life leading up to school entry. And we in the early childhood world know that uh, those pre-K or kindergarten teachers or in some states, first grade teachers that have these children that might be first time enterers, if they come from at risk areas, you know, we all joked, I swore that the folks at CCSSO, and I love Rolf to death, uh, but I swore he and his folks messed up. They're not mathematicians. They had to put a comma in the wrong place when they said a uh, 30 million word gap. And I said, nah, Rolf's crazy. He's put the comma somewhere wrong. That can't be right. Think about that, though, in all seriousness, for these first or first grade or kindergarten teachers to have children coming to them that will have that kind of gap. And what do we ask them? We ask them in about 180 days of education to close that gap. It's, it is, it's not fair. And I, and I know I hate to say fair, and it, it's, it's what we deal with. So what I've tried to do is do a little bit about what Carrie and Paolo are actually talking about, and that is present our P3 approach as it cannot stand as a pre-K to third grade approach in the school system alone. It must be a pre-K to third grade approach in context of the community. And we have to start paying attention to the root causes of what our schools are dealing with, whether it be drug overdoses, whether it be poverty, whether it be trauma, abuse, you had a whole list of Palo put up there that their advisory council was looking at. And so every time I speak to legislators or governors or our state board or our school superintendents, I continue to push that idea of everything we're doing, we have to do in context of what the community is. So, you know, listening to Carrie talk about the NAEP scores, you know, we know there's some indicators there that if you see those move and if you can get those to shift any, 
Yeah, man, we are patting our teachers and our schools on the back when they can make that happen. Well, I want to take it a step further here. I actually want to begin patting the, uh, the, the county businesses, local communities. I want to start making education a, a truly community effort here when we, we talk about these pre-K to third grade approaches. Now, Stephen, I don't want to go on too long. I know that we're under time, but I will say I want to bring it back to context of COVID. Um, I'm very, very proud of our universal pre-K approach, our collaboration rates, our access, what we're doing for third grade. We've pushed some of these ideas up into grade six through 12, which I, I'm absolutely loving. I love the idea, just like Paolo, we have social emotional standards now all the way up through high school. Um, you know, we continually heard the business field tell us that, you know, we have to focus on those soft skills. We have to focus on that interaction and preparing children for the future. And then in the state of West Virginia, March 13th happened. Uh, March 13th for us is the day that every school closed. And um, um, March 13th is a big, big day for me. March 13th is the day that I think, just like the other school leaders on this call, that's the day I stopped sleeping. Um, we have you know, 100,000 children in this state that qualify uh, for free and reduced lunch. They're at risk. Um, to know that for five months, They've not been in a brick and mortar school that we know is a safe, secure place for them. To know that they may not have, uh, in our state, we're focusing on one caring adult as we move forward into reentry. And I found that uh, as the weeks went on, you know, in West Virginia, we did call it triage. We can all, Joe, you know, pull the wool over uh, everybody's eyes and say that we did what we could around remote learning. And we didn't. We just didn't. We weren't prepared. We found out that nearly half of our students in the state of West Virginia did not have access to internet. Uh, we found out that uh, many of the families, um, in five months, we have now reached a six-year low of Child Protective Services referrals in the state of West Virginia. That's a really, really scary thing for us, that we've got to have eyes on these children. And so in the state of West Virginia, I will tell you that our pre-K third approach, thank goodness we had the communities involved. Thank goodness mm -hmm. we had head starts and child cares and churches, everybody we could think of to be involved because what's happened since March 13th is without them, I think we'd be in much worse shape. But I also think it's a lesson learned as we move forward. Um, up until that date, 25 years in education, I would have said absolutely that public education is a great equalizer. And since March 13th, um, this is almost embarrassing to say, but I'm worried that if we expect things to move forward in the pandemic and that learning to take place beyond the brick and mortar building and to take place at home, remote, virtual, mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of work to do to make sure we're taking care of the whole child. Um, I do believe with Terry, I think that we have and can do a lot around virtual learning, remote learning, children can learn in different modes, but uh, we in West Virginia will not give up this idea of one caring adult, lessons learned from pre-K through uh, third grade, have got to uh, move forward into grades four through 12. And even up into high school, we have got to focus back to Palo's, uh, uh, the whole child. Great, I appreciate that, Gordon. All right, Jillian, love Ooh. to hear your, uh, we, you've had a lot to process here from our, your three colleagues who uh, have, have covered a lot of ground here, but would love to hear any reactions you have, and then, you know, what you guys are working on in Wyoming. Again, another big rural state, uh, you know, tele getting internet access, I mean, same kind of issues. I know for you that we've heard from our other chiefs here, but love your your thoughts here as well, and then we'll, we'll get a discussion going. Yeah, well, first of all, it's both humbling and helpful when you sit on a panel and you're gonna leave with over a page of notes that you've taken from your colleagues. Um, Paolo, Carrie, Clayton, fantastic um, work that you all are doing. And um, I get to be sort of the Eeyore of this group and sort of the, the dark cloud, um, which is not a place that I'm used to because I am generally always finding the silver linings. So I wanna put some context around that really quickly and just say that I'm a teacher by trade, uh, but my pathway in policy has been a policy advisor to our former Governor Meade where um, two of my policy areas were tribes and early childhood. 
And when I started and found out I was doing tribes and early childhood, I'm, I said, early childhood, great. That's my bailiwick. Tribal is going to be as political as all get out. Well, it turned out to be exactly the opposite. And both were challenging, but working, yeah. um, working on our tribal relations, I found to be uh, much more black and white, much more um, predictable. Uh, usually in a good way in terms of outcomes for negotiations than early childhood. Um, early childhood was riddled with politics from the get-go that really trickled down to outcomes for our most vulnerable and youngest learners. And that was disheartening right from the get-go. Um, that same governor appointed me to be the administrator over all of our subsidy programs after a couple of years. So I oversaw SNAP child care subsidies at the time I was overseeing Medicare for a bit. We transferred that out and a few other things. And so then I got to see firsthand what it was like to work on things like a, um, a, a longitudinal data system, a high quality rating system for child care. Um, I saw what it was like to try to get additional funding from the legislature and work on governance for early childhood. And again, it was a constant struggle from, um, from that vantage point too. So um, in this position, uh, which I've been in now for almost six years, um, we, you know, really it's, it's sort of the third leg of the Eeyore stool, if you will. Um, and what really bogs us down from making a lot of pro pro uh, uh, progress in early childhood. So I want to tell you that I think at the core of that is, I want to tell you what's not at the core, but is sometimes blamed, and that's that Wyoming is a rural state and we don't have the numbers to support a robust early education system. That's simply not true. What is, what is at the core of this is, um, is our governance structure and our policy structure. And since I've been involved in this, there have been three attempts from the executive level or executive branch, the legislative branch, and a dual executive and legislative branch to try to define some governance, put a structure in place to support the great efforts that were happening at the local level. And Paulo, you said that you said that best. You said at the state level, we sometimes lag. And that is no truer. We have a lot of really great disparate quality efforts going on in early childhood, but we do not have a state structure that follows that with dollars or with support. And it is so disheartening. So here are a couple of things that, um, that we don't have in Wyoming. We do not have a lead agency that oversees education. We do not have a strong advisory council that makes decisions um, without <clears throat> putting politics and, um, and, and individual dollars first or authority sometimes. Um, we do not have a structure to work together as agencies and we miss a lot of dollars and grant opportunities as a result because of infighting. Mm -hmm. And I'm being as honest as I can on this um, and it's hard to talk about. Uh, we have worked on it at least three times since I've been involved with legislative efforts and they have gone from either um, resulting in, in fighting where people say we can't do anything more to we're not even going to release this report publicly. Um, so here's where we've leaned in on or where we've leaned in um, and, and where my agency is as a state superintendent. We've leveraged the partnerships that I built by being a, a policy advisor in the governor's office and also overseeing subsidies. Um, we work collaboratively with our Department of Family Services on a bucket of TANF funding, and we help fund 13 preschools across the state that meet um, high quality standards as well as TANF standards. We um, also have, since we don't have a high quality or a rating system that is robust, um, we have incorporated all of the pre-K professional development in with our K-12 professional development. So our, um, as, as our uh, early childhood educators are getting their continuing credits, they are also 
getting credits toward uh, getting the same credits that our kindergarten through third grade teachers have access to, which has allowed us to put literacy front and center. Carrie, thank you for the wonderful documents because we don't have the capacity to develop those. And so we can take our marching orders from states like Miss Mississippi and, um, and utilize and leverage the documents that we have. We also really encourage our K through 12 schools uh, through the funding structure, the block funding model that we have, as well as with their Title I dollars to make sure that they're standing up pre-K programs that serve the community. And we also, Clayton, thank you for talking about the context of the community. We also really encourage, because that's our greatest strength here, right? Even though there are some turf wars at the local level and some we want our autonomy, but we want you to help us and we want you to give us money, we know that kids are being served um, in some really high quality programs despite ourselves, um, despite the, the lack of effort that we've made at the state. So um, like I, I've reorganized our staff to make sure that we've got staff that's dedicated to work with community providers, community partners, etc., to really just try to uplift and, um, and elevate and celebrate the great work that's going on. Um, but <clears throat> you know, that's a uh, that, uh, that that's kind of a tall order when we don't know exactly what's happening in our preschools and when we don't have a structure, either funding or policy to attach to that. So I'll stop there. Suffice to say that, um, you know, we do, we do have state funding that augments our parts B and part C. We are the only state in the nation uh, where the SEA does not have authority over part B. Uh, that rests with the Department of Health. Mm -hmm. And so um, we just do our very best to really try to partner with agencies and with entities um, and always include them in what we're doing uh, to make the, to, to make lemonade out of lemons. So there's my ER <laughs> moment, which is super Super uncomfortable for me and so um, uh, but hopefully good context to see that across the nation we're in really different spots yeah no I really appreciate that Jillian and you're right that the EOR mod that's not what I think of when I think of you I never would put you're not the poo the poo character that I would put down is not for you is not EOR probably but I appreciate that there's a dose of reality this isn't hard this isn't easy to do it's this is hard to do even in good times, much less with with multiplying calamities. So, um, so I, I've got a couple of questions just to get us rolling here, but I would encourage any any participants on the line here, if you've got questions, to um, to put your questions in the chat. Uh, any questions for our four chiefs, and we can get a discussion going. I'd like to start off with and, and uh, both a, a couple of you guys spoke to this um, as much as we think about you know these big frameworks and and long term changes and funding models and partnerships and all these things that take time to build, school is starting right away. Um, and you've got, uh, Clayton, to your point, you've got families uh, that haven't been back to school, kids who haven't been back to school since mid-March. You have kindergarten families who would be going into, or pre-K families that would be going into kindergarten this fall or into first grade this fall. You know, I know as, again, as a husband of a preschool teacher, it's a lot of work getting kids ready to go to school and riding on the school bus and all those kinds of things to get these kids take care of their anxiety about about going and, and becoming part of a broader school community. How are you guys thinking about setting aside the longer term plans, which I want to come back to? How are you thinking about what guidance, what role are you playing around this fall and, and building comfort and helping families uh, and communities sort of think through how do we get these kids started into school uh, at these, at, you know, at these pre-K kids when all of this is going on? And, and how are you thinking about that in terms of this fall? That's a great question, Stephen. So um, you're right. We're in West Virginia. We are actually four weeks away from our targeted start date. September 8th has been identified by the governor here in West Virginia okay. as a targeted start date. Now, that doesn't mean that all 55 districts will start. If he feels that any of them um, are still unsafe, he will not pull the trigger and open them. They'll start remotely. Scares me on a whole new level uh, of that. Yep. I mean, especially as a pre-K and kindergarten. So we have been doing a lot of work with our districts. Um, they understood that several weeks after March 13th, um, I came out uh, publicly um, on behalf of the governor and the State Board of Education to reprioritize our focus. Um, and we came out very, very loudly with a reprioritize, and this will sound odd to the group, especially all state chiefs, but 
Um, we ended up putting achievement third. And I'm just gonna let everybody know, we put it out there and very, very clearly, social, emotional, mental health, physical uh, well-being had, had to be first, followed by equity issues that we were seeing. Um, and then followed by, of course, we will not lose sight that we still have an achievement issue. So as August has approached, we've actually begun using that same uh, kind of story I said, you know, if you were a four-year-old in our universal pre-K system and you left March 13th, my goodness, what are we expecting on right. September 8th right. when a child comes back? So we already had a lot of work going around, similar to I think Carrie also has some work in uh, Mississippi around um, a actual transition plan from pre-K to kindergarten, kindergarten to first. I think they've done a lot of work with their families mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. So have we. So we're actually asking um, um, our pre-K collaborative teams. I forgot to mention this earlier. Every county in the state of West Virginia must have. It's required in law. You have a universal pre-K team. It is your um, child care partners, your Head Start partners, your school partners, and then you have ex kind of officio members of the community. So we're ask, actually working with them um, we okay. are scrambling on some trauma-informed care and PBIS, early childhood PBIS, um, and we're also have a partnership with our PBS, our public broadcast broadcasting station. So mm -hmm. they're now beginning to uh, put out public messaging. Um, next week, we launch a bus message of how to prepare safely to come back on what the transportation will look like. Your school may look a little different. Um, and mm -hmm. then we actually have a series of messages we're trying to put out to especially our younger learners of what it may be like to come back into the school and how parents can help them get ready with either seeing teachers in face masks, getting on the bus a little differently, reinforcing our washing of hands and social distancing. And I keep yeah. laughing. Good luck with the pre-K and kindergarten with that. Um, but no, it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a community effort. Yep, that's great. Yeah, I'll just piggyback on that. The, I think that there's been two messages that we've been trying to give, and that is, number one, for the first couple of weeks, just to focus on climate, just getting kids acclimated, making sure that they're comfortable, that you're getting a sense of those that are really so fearful, um, et, et cetera, and all the new practices that are going to be in place. I mean, having been an elementary teacher, you know, when it comes time to, you know, take little ones, because I was taught at second grade as well, to the bathroom and, you know, about the hand washing and, and you know, as Clay just said, now we're adding the mask wearing and staying six feet apart. That's just not what little ones do. They cling to each other. They're always got their arms around each other. So this is a whole... Right. They're always covered in liquid for some reason. They're always wet. Oh, that's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly I don't know. Exactly Where's that coming from? That's right. And the other thing that the other messaging that I've been doing, um, I've, I've been te telling the superintendents and the principals and teachers, please do not use the word remediation when children are coming in. That is just the glass half empty model. Let's talk about accelerating learning. How can we accelerate your learning? And so that's the one thing we've said. I had teachers say to me, well, should I pick up the fourth quarter standards and start with those in September? And I said, absolutely not start with your current grade level standards. I said, you're gonna know once you start with the grade level standards, which ones they may have missed, and then you can supplement. But we've gotta accelerate learning. I said, if you start with a whole quarter, you're gonna be behind the entire year. And I said, so start with current grade level standards and, and move on. Yeah. And the other thing I wanted to um, put a bug in Clayton's ear about too, when he talked about really focusing on his businesses, um, in our Early Learning Collaborative Act, there is a tax credit that's given to any business or individual that donates money to their, uh, their um, neighborhood collaborative. And when we first started that the first year, we had Navy collected, and it goes right to the collaborative, and they get a tax credit, a matching tax credit. Um, we had about two hundred or three hundred thousand dollars by the end of the first year. Now we are well over three million dollars that businesses are donating to these collaboratives and getting a tax credit. So that has been a huge policy piece. I think that was really smart of our legislature to do that as well. Right. What's the thoughts on this fall? I'll chime in a little bit here, Steve. Um, you know, a couple of things. One is, I think we saw so much innovation and um, um, and commitment during the closure that we had in the spring. A lot of my messaging is about how do we sustain that? Some, some of these yeah. things that people were doing in terms of family engagement, 
that they'd never done before, but they finally had a little time. And, and the only way to figure out whether a student was engaged was picking up the phone and talking to parents. And the next time you know, you're sharing, you know, you're building a relationship that maybe never existed outside of a parent teacher conference before, you know, we're saying build on that, you know, think through mm -hmm. what, what had energy, what created stronger connectivity between the home and the teacher and do more of that. All these community organizations that pitched in for food distribution, for, you know, doing things to support kids. And so how do we, how do we build on that? So some of the things that we learned, I think there's a real, um, you know, desire to not lose that, uh, leverage that as we go into the new year and use it to, again, create that, mm -hmm. that support structure uh, around students, stronger family uh, engagement, stronger community engagement, uh, and, um, and uh, uh, you know, leverage it. Yeah. So, so learning on, on what happened in the spring and what can you take forward to work? Yeah. And, and I'll just add that in the Smart Start guidance that we released as a state, communication to parents, um, especially with an emphasis on those that are transitioning <clears throat> either into school or into a new school, um, was going to be key. Uh, and, and so, you know, that, that, that underscores everything, right? You're right. We did get into a habit of, of um, communicating differently and more with families. Um, we, mm -hmm. we got into a habit of seeing a lot of our families who aren't typically engaged, more engaged than ever. And so the question is, how can we harness that? And I think the beauty is that in kindergarten, um, the parents and the families and the kids are already really motivated to start formal, formal school, regardless of what that looks like. So if we can harness that, and, and really move that forward and, um, and, and watch that grow. That's a good thing. Yeah. Let me build off that a little bit, Jillian. Uh, we've talked a few times about this sort of community and family engagement. That was one of your pieces on your, on your whole child uh, model that you showed us, Paolo. Um, at least in my experience from back in the day when I was at the department in Maine, I mean, direct engagement with, with families and, and local communities was not something that the SEA did. We didn't really have a family engagement strategy. Um, what do you guys see as the state agency's role? Is it is it you building tools and doing outreach to families and communities and parents, especially with the COVID thing going on and parents being anxious about all of that? Is it about supporting the districts and giving them tools and encouraging them to do this kind of engagement? How do you guys see your role as SEA leaders in, in encouraging a deeper kind of engagement, the kind you just described, Jillian, it's just different than we've done before. Um, how, what's, your, what's the state's role in making those engagements work better than they have in the past? You know, we, we've asked ourselves um, that same question from day one. The last few weeks, I'm gonna say it's, um, it's shifted a bit for us. Uh, there, there's a lot of misinformation about out. Um, mm -hmm. about what's happening in schools for the beginning of school year. There's a lot of um, uh, questions about who's making the decisions. And so from the state perspective, the answer to your question is yes. We've, mm -hmm. I, I think as, as chiefs, we've really found it necessary, necessary to engage on multiple levels. Um, I've started just a little web series called Back to School Bits where I do like two minute videos and I read from the current state health orders and I talk about sports and, um, you know, and, and say, look, this is, this is the state. This is what the state's saying that needs to be done. These are the considerations that your local school district is making. And as a parent, you're empowered to reach out to coaches, to teachers, to principals, to get the answers about what's going on in your community and be a decision maker. So I think it's empowering. It's empowering parents to continue to be communicative with their school districts. It's school districts um, kind of looking to you as a little bit of cover to say, mm -hmm. you know, the state's making us do this. And then it's, uh -huh. the, it's the state saying, yeah, this is, this is what we're requiring, but every community looks different. And so for, mm. for me anyway, and in the chief's discussions that I've had over the last uh, few weeks, that that role is constantly shifting for us. And mm -hmm. I haven't had much communication directly with parents, but I'm getting letters and questions and emails yeah. every single day. So I really feel it's incumbent on me to address that from a state policy perspective. Mm -hmm. and, and model what you would like to see the districts do. So, yeah. 
So I would say also, um, we did, we, I would say to your initial question, there's both. I think it's a state's role right. to, um, to, you use the word model, but to, to demonstrate to districts what they, 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 what good family engagement looks like. It's right. also a state's role to put, I believe, to put resources in districts' hands to help them do that. Uh, mm -hmm. We also went out and got a grant from Kellogg, the Kellogg Foundation, to hire early childhood coaches and family engagement specialists in order to help us with, with this work. Because I think that it is going to look, as Jillian just said, it's going to look different in every community. But there's a general framework from which we should all be working in terms of how we can support families. We have really doubled down on our social media. We have been putting mm -hmm. a lot resources on our social media and access to those resources so the parents have access to that. Uh, and when we launched that uh, Strong Readers um, uh, website uh, for parents, uh, got a lot of positive feedback on that and that we're just going to continue to add to that. I just think you've got to be thinking about how do you reach out to, um, to different communities in different ways because you've got some mm -hmm. communities that highly engaged families, which is great, and you've got others right. that don't. So our job has been, before COVID, we've been conducting huge uh, community events around the state, uh, focusing on getting parents to these meetings uh, and ways to help their children at home and then providing make and take sessions for these parents. So we were doing a lot of outreach, <laughs> yeah, as, uh, as Clayton said, prior to March 13th. Um, but, we've still, but we've still been developing resources. In fact, what we're going to be doing this fall we're going to be providing virtual webinars to our parents um, that uh, as a way to reach them uh, and help them with the technology that's at home, but also mm -hmm. parents, you know, uh, and, and some of these tough things and tough times. So those are some things that, that we're thinking about too. That's great. Um, any other thoughts on the parent engagement piece? I think our commitment is to continuing to help districts and individual teachers strengthen what they shine light on good practice because ultimately yeah, yeah. build happens at that at that retail level right one on one um, and 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 sometimes if you don't know what better looks like you don't you don't try better and so we see a lot of our job as hey have you thought about this have you thought about that they're doing this over here they're doing that over there it's showing good payoff uh, meet parents where they are uh, find ways to make connections how do you mm -hmm. uh, leverage students uh, to, to, to be that connective tissue sometimes, those kinds of things. Yeah, so holding up best practices that you see, that's my yep. thing, yeah. Okay, so we've got a question in the chat here. Um, have there been opportunities to engage the business community in the work of pre-K to third grade alignment? And if so, what are some examples of how businesses have been involved? We talked a ton about partnerships on this call already. How are you guys thinking about the business partnerships here and what they can bring to the table uh, as you, you know, you're building this kind of network or this ecosystem of support around your efforts in this area? What's the, how are you talking to and engaging with the business community around this? Stephen, if you want, I'll go ahead and at least start on West Please. Virginia's end. Um, so being a part of pre-K, I'll tell you, 20 years ago, if um, the state education agency would have come to me as a pre-K teacher and said, we want to engage with you in a discussion about college career readiness, I would have been like, no, get out. Seriously, you guys, I don't want right. the push down approach. I don't want the push down model. 20 years later, I've actually come full circle. Um, I'm willing to engage the business community in a really robust discussion of college and career readiness because Right. I think when they find and you get them engaged, they have so much to say about what they're looking for uh, for the future workforce, for example, here in West Virginia, that they actually become very, very engaged and invested in what our pre-K to third grade approach looks like. When they start to understand the science behind early childhood and a lot of those executive functions and foundational skills that actually happen prior to eight or nine years old, they start to understand that those stackable skills are exactly what they're looking for. And of course, all of us on here are going to, uh, you know, buy into the whole philosophy that everything I learned in life, I learned in kindergarten, come on. Um, so, I mean, I say that to our superintendents all the time, that uh, if we could just go all go back to kindergarten, we'd all be much, much better. But in all seriousness, I will tell you that the, the business community here 
uh, we've really started to focus a lot of effort they do with us on college career readiness, allowing them to really engage with us on what that looks like as we go back down into the, uh, the school system and not being afraid to have those discussions. And also, to be honest with you, uh, really empowering our families and our pre-K to third grade teachers of the very, very serious role they play mm-hmm. in preparing mm-hmm. uh, for, that, for that workforce. So Steve, I'll, I'll, um, I'll take a shot at that, but from a really different perspective, um, because we have GEPAs and, um, and governor's staff on here, it's been really interesting, you know, to, to sort of parse out this conversation of response and recovery with education um, across the spectrum, pre-K through college. And, um, and every single, you know, grade band or, or uh, pre, you know, childcare pre-K, and K-12 and post-secondary has its very own challenges. But to think mm-hmm. about our child care centers and our high quality preschools um, as being not only sort of this essential component within a community in terms of the service that they provide, but also um, in terms of um, you know, small businesses. A lot, of, a lot of our preschools are also small businesses. So to consider them in that context as well has been really interesting. And I don't really think that that's how Jim L. meant for the question to come out. Mm-hmm. But I just want you, you know, I, I guess I just want folks on the, on, um, on the call to understand that, you know, that's another dynamic that I think we haven't considered very much in terms mm-hmm. of this early education context as educators or as SEAs, but it's very much a part of the COVID conversation in our state value that um, that high quality centers not only lend to children in terms of starting their education right, but also in terms of a small business and the essential mm-hmm. service that they provide in a community. Mm. Other thoughts about business engagement roles? The one thing that we have um, done in Mississippi, the Mississippi Economic Council, which is basically the the state's chamber of commerce, if you will, um, has really embraced early childhood as one of their top priorities. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so they have been a great voice for us because they conduct all of these tours around the state uh, and they talk about what their priorities are. And, you know, I think that's been very helpful um, for, for people to see exactly the, the power behind early childhood. And to Clayton's point, that's, that they recognize that, that if you can link the early childhood to college and career readiness or workforce development, yeah. that to me is huge because there's so much research out there around the, the power of high quality early childhood into adulthood and the fact right. that they're more likely to be employed, they're more likely to graduate from high school, they're more likely to go to college, they're less likely to be involved in drugs, they're less likely to be involved in crime. I mean, and people, if you can get people to see the link between that to that end, um, that's something that, and the voice of the Mississippi Economic Council, I think is a, is a powerful voice for us. So um, keep an eye on the clock here. We got uh, just about 10 minutes left. I'd like to um, pivot off something, an observation you made, Jillian, about the folks we have on a call here, governor's office staff, other policymakers, educators. Um, you know, as, as folks leading in this space, what, what recommendations, advice um, would you have for the folks on this call or what ask would you have of the folks on this call who may work in other areas of this space in terms of how we work together to collectively move the needle on this? What do you, what do you all need from governor's offices, from legislators, from community organizations? What do you need them uh, to be leaning in on? What, what, what is your ask of them? What's it, what advice would you give them? How do we, there's been a lot of talk about partnerships, community building. Um, what do you need from the other folks on this call? Or what would you have the other folks on this call do to, so that we can collectively move forward again, especially in the context of the the several crises that we're that we're dealing with. So, I to me, the power of collaboration cannot be understated. And so, for me to be able to collaborate in a genuine manner, and I can honestly say that here in Mississippi, you know, with my governor, with the speaker, with the lieutenant governor, with my ed chairs, with the legislators. Mm-hmm. 
Um, because as they're drafting legislation, it's critical to have, you know, have all of us at the table doing that. And to develop sound policy is huge, not only at the legislative level, but even at the state level, because the good policy is going to drive good behavior. And so I yeah. think if we all be on the same page about what is it that we want, how can we go about getting there, and how can we work collaboratively to draft the policies, draft the legislation that's going to help in that um, I, mm -hmm. I, I can't say enough about um, we could not I could never have done this without the collaboration of um, the legislature and uh, elected leadership mm -hmm. I think the other thing to build off that is policy coherence right if you can involve right. all these interests in the creation of the frameworks or the strategic plan configurations or whatever and then say mm -hmm. whatever we do let's align to this so we don't we don't have these one-offs, right? Because to me, sometimes the challenge is someone gets this idea that, oh, we want to do this and it doesn't really fit or it runs counter to some other idea. And the next thing you know, you're trying to build loose connective tissue that doesn't yeah. really feel right. So to the extent that you can get everybody singing out of the same hymnal, that doesn't mean I'm asking <laughs> right. you know, on, on what they believe, but, but, but figure out how that belief is amplified and in part of the overall structure so that we're all, you know, we're all contributing to what we've agreed mm -hmm. is, the, is the common approach. Paolo, I so you start with that. that. I'm sorry, I was gonna say, uh, Paolo, I refer to that as let's don't chase rabbits. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Something there about the common framework, uh, Paolo, you shared with us your strategic plan that you worked on for the first, uh, you were in office probably two years <laughs> or at least trying to put that together was a ton of work. I know we worked with that on that, but getting that common vision, that common sort of goal, set of goalposts, feels like that comes first, then the policy frameworks come after that to achieve that goal. Is that the order of operation? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and sometimes you have to acknowledge that some things have happened before and how do you fold those in? So yep. I mean, it doesn't happen in a vacuum, but yeah, right. if, to the extent that you can get everybody to a, to a shared point of here's what we're trying to accomplish, that I think is a great starting point towards coherent policy development. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and Stephen, I'll just add just lessons learned here. I told you earlier, we're getting ready to celebrate 19 years next uh, yeah. in the spring for uh, our universal pre-K. And I think for those on the phone, what was very difficult and continues to be difficult is when you have solid policy, solid vision, as, as Carrie and, and Paolo are talking about, getting um, governors, legislators, and everybody to understand that uh, these results are large, large systematic changes, and they're not going to sometimes happen within a time frame we think. Um, we put a 10-year window in universal pre-K in West Virginia, and I always say that was one of the smartest things the legislators and the governor at that time did. We needed time to uh, make it solid, make it, uh, um, make sure that it had the resources behind it, uh, the funding structure. Um, but getting everybody to, to understand that vision and, and the time that it does take to, to do a statewide change or implement implementation has been important here. Right. Are you suggesting that legislators don't have that long-term vision? Because I will say as a former legislator, they actually don't have that long-term vision. Right. I was not going to um, say that, so, Stephen, but you know. I uh, said it. I, I said it. So you <laughs> uh, how did you, so what, can I, can I just press on a little bit? When you say the 10 year, was there something in statute that said, that set a 10-year yes. target? Like you locked that in, in statute? Yes, oh, wow, okay. Yeah, we sure did. So you and had a that, long on-ramp and some measurements and some things like that going. Okay. That is correct. Uh, we had a long-term 10-year plan um, to implement statewide. We knew that, uh, you know what? We just had a governor and you find those champions in legislation that, mm -hmm. uh, that want to be champions and carry this message forward and understand the the science behind it. And when you start understanding the, uh, the impact is, you know, Carrie and, and Jillian and others have said about even the child care. You know, those were businesses that we wanted to be part of the system. We wanted to head start to be part of the system. And um, getting everybody on the same page does take time. Um, but, yeah. um, you know, years later, if you have solid policy um, with solid resources, uh, it, it's, mm -hmm. it, it could be powerful. And the, I think the only thing that I would have to add is, first of all, thank you for the lessons learned from my colleagues, because like I said, the notes have been pretty invaluable. But um, for, for those that are on this call um, and having uh, been in several different roles in our state effort around early childhood, um, I just cannot, um, 
underscore the importance of the governor's office. And I know that that's really murky water sometimes if you don't have an early childhood governor, um, because it, you know they, their perspective or their their depth of the the topic may be as a as a mother or father or grandparent or aunt or uncle or business owner. And, um, and that there are a lot of allies in the SEA, in um, communities, et cetera, and that um, just the conversation that the governor's office can stir around early education efforts is, um, is pretty profound and can really move things both in the legislative branch um, and maybe more importantly, it can help set that long-term goal that Clayton discussed, um, which is I think really key to all of this. And as I reflect on that, I think had we ever in a, at a point in time been able to sort of um, sort of measure our efforts long term or think about measuring them long term that mm -hmm. we may have some different outcomes in Wyoming so um, so I guess that's just what I would offer and, and again going maybe looping back to Carrie's point it's that power of collaboration I can't imagine doing this without really really vested um, allies across the board that don't always agree with me our agendas may be different but we can work together and um, and agree on some pretty significant underpinnings about where we need to go and what we need to do to serve kids. Great thanks Jillian. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Matt here to, to close us out, but let me just take a minute to thank the four of you for your time. Again, I know you've got no end of things on your plate to deal with and um, that you would take 90 minutes out of your uh, day to, to dig in on this issue in the midst of all of this just says a lot about your commitment to this work. It's critically important. I think we, we made the observation earlier, early childhood work is hard to do on the best of days. The, the level of collaboration and cooperation and cross-agency work and dealing with cultural challenges. And there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot. It's hard to do even in the best of times and to keep this moving forward in the, mid of, in the midst of uh, stacking calamities here is just a testament to the leadership you all have, have shown. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll turn it over to, to Matt to, to uh, get us wrapped up. Awesome. Thank you, Stephen. And, and thanks to all the state chiefs for your uh, candid and very powerful comments. I, I think it was very refreshing to hear these perspectives. Uh, so we're going to take a quick 15 minute break. Our next session is entitled Transitions and Learning Supports in a Pandemic Context, and that will start at 245 Eastern. Um, I think, Erica, if you want to share the screen, we have a little prompt for folks to, to more directly access that session, too, if you can throw that up there for, for people so we can Maybe just keep that open. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Or it looks like Tiffany's.